Hello and welcome to the research platform where we discuss everything related to research. Angelo Tube welcoming you back. Today we're discussing research design. Now, this is the overarching design of your project. You know, how you are going to lay out your project, how it's going to look like. So many factors um, influence what we call the research design. So this overarching structure that we call the, the research design will actually be a plan on how to answer the research questions that you have come up with. So like I said, many factors will influence this. These range from your methodology. They range from the types of research questions that you are posing and the manner in which you, you, you intend to go about answering those particular research questions. So your research design will be influenced by those particular issues, your data collection methodologies, your data analysis uh, and, and, and how you intend to eventually report or, or, on, on those findings. In other words, your report writing is also part of your research design. Now, remember we are looking at research in the context of the humanities, in the context of the social sciences, which is you know, the broader scheme of uh, knowledge within which the legal field or law falls into. Our research in law is centered within the context of social sciences research, the context of humanities um, research. Now, look, law has a unique way of researching. We, unlike most researchers who would actually go on the ground and, 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 and dig deeper and, and you know, talk, talk, talk to human subjects and stuff like that, we often do not do those things. We often simply rely on desktop research. We review articles, we review books, we review reports, and then we take those, contextualize them, analyze what others are saying about a particular issue, decide if we agree or disagree with them, debate this thing back and forth, and then produce our report. That is how we mostly do our research in the legal field. That is the focus of today's um, research uh, discussion on the research platform. So we talked about a research question. Remember, you cannot embark on any research project if you do not have a research question. Whether it's a term paper, whether it's a mini thesis, whether it's a master's thesis, whether it's a PhD thesis, whether it's a journal article or a chapter in a book, if you do not have a research question around which you are building your arguments, you cannot have what you call, you cannot undertake what you call research. It will be a waste of time, really. You need to first have a research question. So what is this research question? Now the research question is the controversy that exists around which you are you're building your entire thesis. So it's, there must exist a legal controversy and your embarking on that particular research must be a way of trying to remedy the existing controversy. So there is a problem and you are going to undertake this particular research in order to answer the questions raised by that problem. That is how you craft a research question. What if you don't know enough about the area to formulate a research question? What then? What do you do? Which is why we always tell our students you need to read widely. There is a need for you to consult as much literature as possible in that field that you think you're going to be researching on before you can realize, look, there's a gap here. There's a lacuna as we call it in law. I need to fill that lacuna in. So it happens most frequently with our students and we always push them towards reading, reading and more reading. Because unless you have read, unless you know what are the prevailing thoughts on a particular topic in a particular field of law, you cannot determine what the gaps are. You cannot determine what the controversies are that need to be rectified in that particular situation. And because you cannot determine those things, you cannot come up with a research question. So for you to come up with a research question, it's imperative for you to, ex to read widely, to consult a number of you know, um, literature, a number of written pieces, a number of reports, a number of books, a number of cases, a number of general articles before you can determine what is missing and then come in um, with that gap and, and, and Fill, and fill that gap with your own theories, with your own newly formulated new knowledge. So reading widely helps you to fo familiarize yourself with prevailing issues in, in that particular area. For instance, if you wanted to write about the International Criminal Court um, uh, right now, you can't just wake up and just write about it. You need to know what are the prevailing issues, what are the controversies, what has been written before, so you don't repeat things that have been overly written. So that will require you to read, you know, to listen to the news, 
to read newspaper articles, to, to read reports by the AU agencies, to, to, to read reports by the UN agencies, to read reports by civil society, human rights organizations, and so forth and so forth. What are the things to look out for? A research question should never be too narrow or too broad. In other words, if you can answer a research question with a few basic facts, then it's not a research question. You're not researching. It's not research at all. What you'd be doing there, you'd be simply searching and not researching. So again, if answering your question requires you to, you know, write a whole book as big as this, then perhaps that's not the question you should be tackling at that particular level. Because the research question must be commensurate with the level at which you are researching. Imagine you're doing a master's module and you look at the research question you've, you, you, you've couched and to, for you to answer it adequately, you would need to actually produce this much work. Then it's not necessarily packed at the right level for you. You need to find another research question. Okay, it's raining heavily in Johannesburg. I need to move inside to finish this recording. So the other thing to look out for is that your research question must be significant. It must not be a question that's posed simply for the sake of posing it. You know, it, you must also pose questions that are capable of being answered. Because asking questions that cannot necessarily be answered legally or do not necessarily need to be answered legally does not constitute proper development of a research question. The research question must also be interesting for you because remember, I've always told my supervisees, those that I supervise for LLM and for you know, and, and for dog traits, they know, I always tell them this, that as authors, we are artists, we paint with our words. You know, it's important for us to choose topics that we'll be comfortable painting with. So it's important for us to choose topics that we'll be able to, to paint, you know, those topics with. Imagine as an artist, you, your, your, your interest is in sunflowers blooming at sunrise, but you're forced to rather paint tomatoes. So yeah, get a topic that excites you because you will be stuck with that topic for as long as it takes to finish whatever project you're working on. If it's a master's project that's a little bit shorter than, you know, doctoral research, so maybe you're not going to be stuck with it for a long time. But if you're doing a doctoral research, honestly, you really want to choose a topic that excites you because if it doesn't excite you in the long run you are going to give up you will not feel motivated to do anything because remember there will be a time when you know creativity will leave you when the zeal and desire to move on in your research will leave you and what will keep you going would be your passion for the topic that you are writing on so do yourself a favor choose a topic that um, excites you like I said, we are artists, you know, we paint with our words. Are you painting tomatoes? Are you painting sunflowers? Which one excites you? Don't be stuck with something you don't necessarily enjoy. I'll make an example of myself. There's a point when I was doing my doctoral um, research, you know, I was supposed to embark on my PhD. And obviously I've been in the academic sector for so long. I've worked in universities for so long. There was a point when I was being pushed towards doing my doctorate in constitutional law you know, in, in, in the Bill of Rights, in, in Section 25, and so forth, and so forth. And while it made sense for those who were channeling me towards that direction for their own institutional purposes, it did not make sense for me to grapple with that particular topic for, you know, a period of two or three years, which however long it takes. So I had to sit down with myself and think, do I really you know, have a conversation with myself and ask myself, do I really want to be pursuing that topic? You know, um, especially the, 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 the land issue in South Africa at that point was a hot topic and everyone seemed to be an expert in it and everyone seemed to be interested in discussing it. And I was like, no, man, that's not what I want to um, employ my mental capacities on. I, I, I want something that's going to be challenging, something that's not, you know, the talk of town, something that's not as popular at, at any given moment. Because my interest lay in international law. My interest lay in international criminal law. So I pushed ahead and ignored that advice and simply went and dealt with um, universal jurisdiction for my PhD thesis, which is an international law component. You know, look at international criminal law, the punishment of off offenders under international law, and what jurisdictional rules are at play there. And indeed, because I was passionate about it, I was able to run with it, even despite the challenges of doing doctoral um, research. So my advice to you would be, 
do not be pushed towards a particular um, topic because it makes sense for other people make sure it makes sense for you make sure it excites you otherwise you'll be stuck with it and you won't even know what you're doing because trust me there are moments in your research um, journey where if you're asked so what are you writing about you scratch your head like um what am i writing about you know you you post the question back to the pers person who asked you the question because you, you have no clue what you're writing about the phd has dealt with you so much <laughs> that you've lost track of what you're doing so make sure that you're excited about the topic that um you're choosing you can sustain it throughout the period of the you know the life of the uh, doctoral research or the master's research whatever it is that you're busy with so tied to that is the tendency by students to choose a topic because it will direct them towards a particular supervisor they want to be supervised by person a therefore they look at their that person's research interests and they tailor their research to fit in the profile of that person whom they want to you know get appointed as their supervisor um, while that is not necessarily wrong um, it's okay to do that but do not tailor your research simply to fall within the research scope of a particular supervisor if that scope is not what you're interested in trust me you will not go beyond chapter two you'll get so bored you know you will clash with your supervisor you will not see eye to eye with him you will find yourself rejecting his advice on how your chapters should be progressing because you chose the wrong topic so make sure that you don't necessarily tailor your research based on who you want to supervise unless your research interests coincide then there's a you know there's a match there but if they don't coincide you're really wasting your time and the supervisor's time so the other thing is to avoid overly researched spaces you know topics that have been overly done over a period of time for instance, there was a time when the International Criminal Court and Africa, the clash that they were having was so current that pretty much wherever you looked, you saw people researching about that. So avoid such. Um, the next thing is the land question in South Africa, Section 25 of the Constitution, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's so overly done. Those are just examples, you know. Unless you're going to be able to find a niche area within that particular uh, research component. And unless you're able to find a very unique angle, stay away from overly research spaces. Because if you don't stay away from them, then what are you contributing? You know, are you not going to be regurgitating what others have said before? And that is not research, it's just a combination or a collation of people's ideas without generating new knowledge without contributing to the body of knowledge because remember we're trying here to contribute to the body of knowledge we're trying here to introduce something new to reveal something new to those consumers of knowledge out there but if it's been overly researched what are you doing there you need to step out and find a space that's not overly researched where you can make a mark where you can contribute to knowledge where you can generate new ideas now, turning to what we call research methodology, what methodology are you going to be using to collect and sift through this information and to develop your or to produce your report? Now, in law, mostly like I said before, we tend to use desktop research. We simply gather literature and we review that literature. We use books, we use cases, we use reports of the United Nations, reports of the AU, we use court judgments, we use um, um, general articles and so forth and so forth. And then we produce new knowledge. Now, the choice of research methodology is critical in the sense that there's so many ethical implications involved in the research methodology that you're going to adopt for your particular study. So make sure that you choose a methodology which will give you the tools with which to answer the research question that you have posed in your study. You also have to keep in mind that there are considerations uh, in line with the Protection of Personal Information Act if you're in South Africa. You will need to comply. Your research must be designed such that it complies with the privacy considerations and the confidentiality considerations of that particular act. So where you're going to be dealing with the personal effects of other individuals, you need to ensure that your research is designed in such a way that it minimizes harm, it mitigates harm, it complies with the requirements of the poppy act so at the very outset you need to determine if you're going to be using quantitative or qualitative research methods and depending on what you are going to choose 
your, your the design of your research, you know, and, and, and your entire methodology must then talk to the um, choice of a research methodology that you have chosen. So like I said, you have quantitative and qualitative research methodology. In law, we embrace mostly the qualitative research methodology. We deal with desktop research, literature review, and so forth. Quantitative involves your descriptive analysis, descriptive statistics. It involves your surveys where you develop um, a five-point linked scale to measure a particular phenomenon. Um, the beauty of this thing is that it, it's scalable. You know, you, you can adapt it. To, it's generalizable. You, 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 you can transmute these findings to a larger population, moving from the smaller population to a larger population. It, 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 uh, it, it's replicable also. So those are the advantages of the um, quantitative methodology. But we run away from it in law. Why is this so? Quite a number of us are now driving this, this process. We learned from our forebears. We learned from those who went ahead of us. I mean, as, as young academics, we looked up to the older professors on how they were doing things, how they were approaching research. You'd find an older professor advising a student to do desktop research because to do otherwise would uh, burden the whole process with ethical clearance applications, delays, this, that, that. But if you look at the, f you know, if you scratch the surface, you realize that this fellow is probably giving this advice because he himself has never really done such um, an exercise, you know? They don't know how to do quantitative research. Now we learned that same behavior and we embraced it because it was normalized, it was a norm. But when you look at it now, you realize there's a need for transformation. You transform that space. If a student wants to dig deeper using quantitative methods, why are we not encouraging that to happen? Yes, the, 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 the process is laborious. You know, the ethical clearance process is laborious. You know, every university has an ethical clearance committee which looks into these type of applications. There's a long form that you need to fill. There's so many details you need to give. Um, some of them are not necessarily in your control. For instance, you need to ensure that you filled in the form. You know, forms are boring, whether they're immigration forms when you land in a foreign country at an airport and you have to fill in those forms. They do have your passport, but they still need your forms. It's, it's those laborious processes and you can make so many mistakes trying to fill in those little blank spaces. But fortunately, the one for ethical clearance is an electronic form that you can fill in, delete and, and so forth. But that having been said, it's still a laborious and, and, and very, very lengthy process. Now, they will need to see that you've already designed the research tool. Many of our students do not have the capacity to design a proper research tool, a questionnaire in layman's terms. So that's what really gives them problems and gives professors problems when in the low fraternity when they're supposed to be supervising students who want to do this. But you need to encourage students to go that way, to create uh, research tools, to fill in that form, to apply for ethical clearance. They need to show, because one of the things that the ethical clearance committee requires of you um, is, is that you give them consent uh, or, or proof that the organization that you're going to be using for your research has consented to what you're doing here. Now, some of those things are not necessarily in your control. You find yourself sitting there waiting for an organization to give you consent and there's so much bureaucracy, there's so much uh, red tape. For instance, I once undertook uh, a study in the, you know, in the era of um, business leadership and I had approached organization A because it was a, a good fit for what I was trying to study. But four months later, I was still waiting for a response from them and my deadline was fast approaching. So out of panic, I approached organization B, organization B processed everything within a week and I had consent to go ahead and conduct my study in their organization. Therefore, I was able to apply for an ethical clearance from certificate from the, from the relevant committee. I mean, 75% into my study, I was about to complete organization B. I mean, A comes back and says, sorry, we cannot assist you. I'm like, it's too late. But those are some of the things that you are faced with when doing quantitative uh, research. You are not in control of some of the processes that you are required to comply with. So the ethical clearance committee wants to understand a lot of things from you. For instance, you are dealing with human subjects. How are you going to ensure their privacy, their confidentiality? How are you going to anonymize your, your data? The, the raw data that you collect, you're collecting, how are you going to anonymize it? And once you've collected it, where are you storing it? How secure is it? For how long are you, are you storing that, that, that data there? What are the destruction protocols? How are you going to destroy that data once you're finished? They want to know all these things. You must include them in your form as you apply. But if you comply with all those things, they will issue the ethical clearance certificate and you'll go ahead and roll out your research. So indeed, part of the problem lies with the fact that we don't train our students sufficiently. Our undergraduate modules in many, many universities are suspect. 
We are training people who are just consuming what they're being given. We're teaching them rather than training them. Just giving them materials and not teaching them how to, you know, um, um, generate knowledge on their own. So they get to master's level, they don't know what to do suddenly. We need to transform the curriculum as well. Transformation should be about changing the way we do things. So the other issue are, um, in, in, in research design is um, the topic. It gives so many students sleepless nights and it's not supposed to be the case. I always deal with many PhD students who come to me with a topic and they insist on the topic. They are focused on the topic and I tell them, forget the topic. Take your topic, put it in the dustbin. Let's start from the research question and the research design. Let's look at the research methodology. How are you going to go about, you know, answering the questions that I want you to raise right before me? Let's start from the beginning. What is the problem? What is the controversy? What is the issue that exists that's so pressing that it needs you to conduct an entire thesis to answer it? And how are you going to answer that particular question? That the topic is not critical. It's not the first and foremost thing that you must focus on. It comes later. In the beginning, you will have a working title or a working topic. It will change as the study matures. In fact, it's supposed to change. Because if it doesn't change, by the time that you finish and submit, your topic will no longer be talking to your thesis. The two have to talk to each other. And the way they talk to each other is you will have a working title, which will improve as your study matures. I hope this was a um, useful episode. Even if it was, please do click the like button below. Do not forget to subscribe as well if you haven't done so already and to urge your fellow compatriots to subscribe and to share and to like these videos. Copy the link from above, paste it in your LinkedIn, paste it in your Facebook, paste it in your Twitter, wherever you are, in whatever community of researchers that you find yourself in. Share this information. It will help a lot of people. It's the only way we can take the African continent forward and make it great again. It's the only way that we can make Africa as a continent, a research-oriented continent. Until next time, enjoy what you saying. Cheers and goodbye.